Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to another episode in our second series of The Health Show, here only on the Islam Channel with me, Alastair Greener. Now, every week we're joined by a health expert within their field of expertise and together we're going to discuss different ways of preventing and treating health issues or concerns that we or our loved ones might face. Many of these issues are caused by an unhealthy lifestyle or maybe a lack of knowledge when it comes to seeking professional advice. Well, that's why we're here, so you can become better informed regarding the various health issues that we're going to discuss with our experts on the show. And hopefully, you'll be able to change your health or lifestyle for the better. So if you'd like any further information on any of the topics or shows that we're going to discuss, then please do get in touch. Health show at Islam Channel. TV. On today's show, where our topic is cardiovascular health, how healthy are our hearts? We'll be discussing the symptoms that someone might experience when they're diagnosed with heart disease and the kind of treatments that are offered. To help us with today's topic, I'd like to welcome Jamie Waterall, who is the national lead expert for cardiovascular disease prevention and associate professor at Public Health England. Joining him, we have Shafali Loth, who is a nutritionist at Blood Pressure UK. She advises patients on the dietary changes required to reduce blood pressure and the risks of stroke and heart disease. And we're very happy that they've both agreed to discuss these issues related to today's topic and to, of course, share their expertise. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. For I think us. we're in for an exciting show. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> now, we must stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or have any concerns, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP, as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health topic being discussed. Now, we're going to talk more with our experts in just a moment, but here's a question for you watching at home. Have you ever asked yourself, is your heart older than you? Well, if you're keen to find out, Let's see with this short clip. I mean, it was fascinating watching there the fact that some of us need to be more aware of what our health of our heart is like. Is this something that you find a lot that we just people are just unaware? Yeah, I think, Alistair, this is a really important point that um, the vast majority of people don't necessarily know that their heart may be older than what is actually um, their, their actual age. So um, what we've been trying to do with the heart age tool is allow people to physically understand what's going on in our bodies. So what we know is often you get um, this substance called atheroma. It's like a porridge substance that forms in your arteries and it happens over many years, um, but you don't physically see it. So the idea of heart age is actually being able to see what is happening in Side. So if someone at home has just seen that, they've just downloaded the app or they've gone online and they've tried it, they've discovered that they actually their heart is significantly older than them, what should they do? So the whole point of the tool is not only knowing what your heart age is, but what happens afterwards. So it'll give you information on the top things that are increasing your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. So for some people that might be smoking, it might be being overweight, having too high blood pressure, for example, or having high cholesterol. But what it will do is then tell you the things that you can do to lower your risk. And let's actually step back a little bit and start with the real basics. We talk about cardiovascular health. Now, are we talking about the heart? Are we talking about the whole blood system in our bodies? What exactly is it? 
So what the tool's trying to look at is um, predominantly two things, your heart and your brain. And we know that this atheroma, this porridge that forms, that increases, basically creates almost like a blockage in, in your arteries, is both affecting your heart and your brain. And what it's looking at is your risk of one of those blockages totally blocking the blood vessel. So it actually then leads to a heart attack or a stroke. So it's looking at the brain as in terms of a stroke, and it's looking at the heart in terms of a heart attack. And what causes this, this atherome to actually build up to, that can then subsequently lead to a heart attack or stroke? So this atheroma develops over many years and um, we know that the predominant features or the things that will increase um, the risk of this atheroma developing, smoking, um, high blood pressure, being overweight, um, drinking too much, for example, um, not taking enough exercise. And then there are other factors as well, like um, having diabetes increases your risk. And then we talk about some of the factors that actually are, are more difficult for us to change. So having a family history, for example, um, actually being of a South Asian background increases your risk quite considerably. Um, and um, things like um, we know more deprived people, li people living in more deprived areas are more likely to have um, heart attacks and strokes. Now, Shafali, you obviously are dealing with nutrition, right. and we all hopefully recognise that what we put into our bodies is directly influencing yeah. what happens to our bodies. Maybe you could go into a bit of myth-busting here for us. Okay. So what is good for us and what is not good for general heart and arterial health? OK. Well, Alistair, I think you'll agree that there's so much in the press every day. Um, one day something will be good for you, the next day it's bad for you. And I think what's important is to look at the science. And the science says that in terms of high blood pressure and heart disease, um, the amount of saturated fat is important that we consume. We need to eat more of fruits and vegetables, which will have a beneficial effect. Um, for high blood pressure specifically, the amount of salt that we eat has a real effect on our high blood pressure. And obviously, high blood pressure is a major risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Um, again, as Jamie said, it's the amount of exercise you take, whether you smoke, how much alcohol you drink, and whether you're of a healthy weight. Let's come back to the food a second. Yeah. We talked about saturated fats, we talked about high salt content, yes. and we've seen a bit in the news about processed foods yes. and that generally if we can cook from scratch ourselves, if we have time mm. and the inclination, that's marginally better. Why, why is that? Well, specifically if we're talking about salt, is 75% of the salt that we consume as a population is already in the food that we buy. So be that processed meals or bread or biscuits, Biscuits or most things that you buy in the supermarket will contain salt. Um, if we have no control over how much salt we have when we're consuming these foods, so at Blood Pressure UK, we try to tell people cook from scratch where you can, avoid adding salt at the table or when you're cooking, and if you are buying processed foods, learn to read the label, see how much salt is in per 100 grams. And if it's over 1.5 grams of salt per 100 gram of product, that's classed as a high salt product. Now, those kind of high salt products would be ketchups, pickles, um, gravies. If you're thinking about a South Asian population specifically, then that's the type of pickles that we eat. And often people will add a lot of salt to food when they're cooking from scratch. And How about these alternatives? Are they any good? We see low salt and there's other brands out yeah. there that claim to have less salt content but give you that flavour. Is, is that valid? They are valid. However, we do say proceed with caution. And the reason is, is they're quite high in potassium. And so that potassium can be harmful if you're if you start taking it and you're already on high blood pressure medication. Um, so actually, it only takes about three months to retrain your salt buds. So if you reduce the salt that you eat or stop adding it to cooking, to start with, your food may taste quite bland, but actually after a period of time, often around 12 weeks, three months, your taste buds will have retrained themselves and you won't be able to tell the difference. Fascinating. We will talk more about nutrition later on because yeah. that's a key part of mm. what we have control of. But if, if we don't do this, Jamie, and the blood winds up having more of this porridge substance, if you like, in there. What are the consequences and, and how long can it build up for? Because there'll be some people watching, maybe who are younger, they're feeling 
quite fit and healthy, and they, they're com probably completely unaware that there's this lurking problem potentially in the background. Mm. So from, from studies, we know actually the atheroma starts in infancy. So as a child, it, it's developing. Um, however, the other important message though, it's never too late to start. So regardless of your age, you can reduce your risk. Um, and it comes back to those important points again. So if you start modifying your, um, your um, uh, the amount you're drinking, the, the, the amount of saturated fats that Safali's talking about, taking more exercise, actually it all can have a, bet, a, a, a positive effect in reducing that atheroma forming. You, you mean this, can this atherome actually be got rid of? So once it's formed, can a healthy lifestyle actually get rid of this yeah. atherome or is it kind of there and we're just halting its progress? Yeah, it's an interesting, so, so the, the evidence suggests that actually regression of the atherome is actually quite difficult. Um, people that go on to high intensity statins, so cholesterol lowering drugs, um, that there's some, there's some belief that we can get some stabilization of, of the plaques, but in large, they're, you know, they're there. However, it's never too late. So even though um, somebody may be thinking at the age of 40 or 50 or 60 even, that it's too late to lower their risk, we absolutely know you can still reduce your risk. And in fact, lower your heart age by taking action. Mm -hmm. And, and looking at the, the sort of telltale signs that actually you are in serious risk of having a stroke, obviously you can use the monitor that you've mentioned there. Is there anything physically that we might notice to say, hang on a second, alarm bells should be ringing here? So there's a few things. So before you actually get to things like having a heart attack or having a stroke, um, you might present with high blood pressure. Now, in large, high blood pressure you don't get symptoms. For some people, they may do. Some people do complain with often very high blood pressure. They may be getting headaches. They may be getting problems with their vision. Um, but, it, but in large, it's silent. Uh, um, yeah, it doesn't. You know, for most people, they won't experience any symptoms. And that's why high blood pressure is called the silent killer, because the first indication people often have when that they have it is when they've suffered a stroke or a heart attack. So really the only way that people know they have high blood pressure is to go and get it tested. Now we see things on the in the news and also on labeling and things about cholesterol and having foods that lowers your cholesterol. Why is cholesterol such a big thing? So we know that cholesterol absolutely increases your chances of that atheroma forming. So high levels of cholesterol add to that fat building in the arteries, that atheroma substance. So that's why it's really important that we have lower cholesterol. I was thinking earlier when you were talking to Farley around, because it's really complicated out there. People don't necessarily know about those hidden salts or those yeah. hidden sugars. Like cereal, for example, some cereals contain huge amount of salt mm -hmm. or sugar, but we've actually developed in alongside the heart age tool, a, sugar, a smart swap that you can do. So if you've got an iPhone, for example, you can actually go and start scanning the barcodes and having a look at the barcodes and it'll come up and it'll show you, for example, how many sugar cubes are in something. People are really shocked sometimes, yeah, Alistair, and look and think, yeah. crikey, that's got 10 or 15 sugar yeah. cubes in. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't go in and put 15 sugar cubes in that drink or something you're about to have. So that can really help sometimes, just get people Absolutely. to kind of understand how much sugar or salt they're actually consuming. Yeah. And as you say, when they're processed foods, it's very difficult to know how much is in there because you you weren't responsible for, for adding it in the no, first place. But yeah. a lot of processed foods will have front of pack labelling and so our advice is to choose foods with green or amber traffic lights and avoid those with red. So you know whether you're at risk and therefore you can adjust what you're taking in accordingly. Let's look now about people who are more prone to it. You mentioned earlier on, Jamie, about people who have a history of it within the family. Mm. What about other things? Are you more, is it possible that you're more prone to having high cholesterol? Are there different blood types? Are there different maybe ethnicities that are more prone to this? So, so the cholesterol one's an interesting one. So we know that there is a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, which is always difficult for people to... Yeah, to I wouldn't even try that one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, familial hypercholesterolemia, this is where there is a genetic link to you having high cholesterol, and it run, so it runs in families. And if you have this, it is really important that you get your cholesterol managed because we then tend to see that people start having heart attacks or stroke really early on in life. So, you know, it could be happening in their 30s and 40s. So, so um, if you have a really high cholesterol, um, the guidance suggests, you know, above 7.5 as a total cholesterol, you should be asking, is there this genetic link? And if it is, it is so important it gets managed. But for the rest of us, um, 
that actually it's that cholesterol can just tend to run higher than what it should be. And it's largely down to our lifestyles, unfortunately. Um, our Western lifestyle, um, not taking enough exercise, not eating the right foods, leads to it being high. And, and actually, that is not genetic. That is down to what we're doing to ourselves. I mean, it's a little bit like weight, isn't it? It's, it's what we put in versus yeah. what we um, put out in terms of exercise and so on. And let, let's talk a little bit about other aspects yeah. as well as nutrition, things like exercise. Mm. Why, why is exercise good for us? Obviously, it's going to reduce our weight, but what other benefits does that have? Well, in terms of high blood pressure, aerobic exercise is very beneficial. And that's because you're getting your blood pumping faster. And so it's keeping your blood vessels healthy. Um, so we recommend, and the government also recommends, that people take five, well, 30 minutes of moderate activity up to, five, well, five times a week. So it could be gardening. It could go be a brisk walk. It could be going for a dance or going swimming. It doesn't have to be running the marathon. I, I, I'm talking about apps all of the time, but only the other week we launched another app, Alistair, and this was about 10 minute brief exercise intervention. So um, because a lot of people, they, mm. they see exercise as a bit of a scary thing, actually. Um, and, if, and if you're not taking much exercise at all, which we know a, a, a large proportion of the public actually take very little exercise altogether, um, doing short um, spurts of 10 minutes is actually beneficial for your health and the chief medical officer has also um, shown in, in their guidance that those short um, bursts of 10 minute exercise but it's exercise where you're feeling out of breath you're starting to feel a bit sweaty you're feeling a bit breathless um, it, it's not a gentle stroll mm -hmm. but you can download this app onto your phone that's showing that you're doing that kind of exercise and I think it just helps people that aren't used to you know running half an hour, you know, once a day or something. So it, it, you can take a gradual increase. Yeah. Um, so short minute, 10, burst, 10 minute burst of exercise is actually good for you. Yeah. Let's just put this into perspective a moment because we, we're talking a lot about cardiovascular health. We're talking about the things we should be doing to keep ourselves healthy. How much of a problem, you, you both working within uh, the NHS and Blood UK and I'm really fascinated what the statistics are of the amount of people who are suffering with cardiovascular health issues and what the consequences of that. Give us some feel of where we're at as a country on that. So, so if, we think, if we think about some of the, the top level figures, um, cardiovascular disease remains one of the biggest causes of premature death. And when I talk about premature death, that's people under the age of 75. It's still one of the biggest causes. About one in four deaths is caused by this cardiovascular disease um, and it affects about 7 million people in the UK wow. alone. Um, and the cost um, to the NHS is, is clearly billions of pounds. But m more importantly to me um, than the, the cost is actually the impact on people's lives. You know, I, I, um, I started my career in, in hospitals. I looked after many people, many a person that had come in with that heart attack or that stroke. And once it's happened, Alistair, I'm sure um, you know, your viewers will know and probably have experienced somebody in the family having a heart attack or stroke. You want to turn back time. You don't want that to happen. Um, and, and, and even if they do survive, because what, what are the rates of survival of um, a stroke uh, or a heart attack these days? I know a lot of it depends on how quick you get to somebody. And so on, but tradition, statistically, how many people is for, for them is that stroke or that heart attack it. So, Alistair, one of the great successes over the last few years, actually, we are, we're seeing people survive these events. It's much greater than it has been in previous years. Um, however, what we're then seeing, which is a challenge, is people living with those conditions. So, um, for example, having a stroke, the potential impact that has on your health, your, your life, um, people potentially having to give up work if they've had that stroke in early on in, in life, um, the disability it leads to. So we're seeing more people survive, but they're then living with the disability of, of, that, of that illness. Mm -hmm. And what about within the Asian community? Because we know within the Asian community, the diet can often be very different. Yeah. Exercise levels are different. There's cultural differences. Yeah. How, how do the Asian community fare? Well, actually, South Asians and also African Caribbeans are far more susceptible to high blood pressure and, as you mentioned, cholesterol and, as a result, um, heart disease or yeah. cardiovascular disease. Well, yeah. well, and we know, for example, um, people from a South Asian background are probably twice as likely to have type 2 diabetes 
and then consequently they're at much greater risk of having a heart attack or, or a stroke. And is this because of the nature of their diet or is this to do with their, their ethnic background? So as a, there's an interesting, you know, if you look at the research, Alistair, and, and academics always love to debate kind of one thing or another, uh, the, you know, there's, there's, there, there's debate within the academic community here, but I think probably in large what people think is going on here is there's a greater abundance of those risk factors that um, we're seeing um, people of great, uh, that have got uh, more problems with their weight, uh, more problems with their cholesterol, you said, greater blood pressure um, findings. Um, there is some, there's some research actually going on at the moment starting to look at actually is there um, issues with insulin, for example, um, but, but there's no yet studies that have concluded um, that, that that is the causal factor, although um, the, the large community believe it's that there, there are more risk factors, those risk factors we've been talking about, that they're, of a, they're in a greater proportion in the South Asian population. So, so let's come back to that, because, again, it, it, it's coming across quite clearly that the majority of cardiovascular issues are actually avoidable. So, yeah. Yeah, Spot on. I'm, I'm really pleased you've raised this. Yeah. So there was, there was one study a few years back that looked at somebody's first heart attack. So um, what, how preventable is that first heart attack? And what the researchers found was 80 to 90 percent of, that, of those first heart attacks are preventable. That's staggering. Yeah. You know, actually, we could be, these people don't have to go on and have that heart attack. And that's a great statistic yeah. to finish our first half with, actually, because in our second half, we're going to talk more about these other things that we can do to prevent it and practical tips and maybe a bit more myth-busting as well. Uh, the same statistic for stroke as well, isn't there? Really? Well, it's time for a short break yeah. now, but don't go anywhere because we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Health Show, where our topic today is cardiovascular health. And so far, we've been talking with Jamie Waterall and Shafali Loth, the main causes of heart problems. We've talked about risk factors as well as some treatments available. But before we continue our discussion, here's a short video where an Egyptian lady who was believed to have been the world's largest woman before her surgery showed off her progress at a press conference in Abu Dhabi, months after drastic weight loss operation took place in India. Uh, I would like to thank you all and especially more video this. And the second now, this is currently taken about 10 days ago. For us, we are uh, target is to bring her below 100 kilograms. It might take time. Uh, it might take, uh, if you ask me, another year. We don't know. But we are willing to walk all that distance with her and the family and uh, make sure that uh, she's as close to normal as possible. Today, we see her again smiling and you know, being happy. So we are very happy that uh, they made good progress. And inshallah, this is only the beginning. We feel that uh, she has to go a long way and uh, make sure that uh, she gets a better quality of life. So that is our main focus. Now, it's amazing watching that video because that was obviously an extreme case where that lady was so overweight. But actually, you don't need to be significantly overweight to actually have problems, do you? No, not at all. Um, even if you're slightly overweight or whether you're obese, it does increase your risk of high blood pressure and also cardiovascular disease. And more so, you don't even have to be overweight. You can be a healthy weight and still have high blood pressure or have high cardiovascular or ha high cholesterol. And that, in turn, can increase your risk of heart disease or stroke. Now we know that being overweight and indeed obesity is something that is quite, is something we see quite often within the South Asian community. What are the risks of being overweight when it comes to cardiovascular health? 
So we know that um, one of the greatest risks is developing type 2 diabetes, for example. And um, it's after the development of type 2 diabetes, we know um, increases your risk of heart disease and, and stroke considerably. Um, but the great thing, Alistair, is it's actually possible to reverse type 2 diabetes. Um, if people have significant weight reduction, we've, I, I have um, cared for patients that have managed to reduce their weight to actually get their glucose back to a normal level that they become um, non-diabetic mm. again. Well, I mean, that, that is great because it's yeah. always nice to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel with all of these things. Yeah. And, you know, often we look at diets and think we're going to have to be on this forever and a day. And in fact, let's come to diet again, yes. because that's such a key factor. We talked about exercise. Let's talk about the foods that we should be eating, the foods that are good for us, yeah. the foods that can fight the onset of cardiovascular problems. Where, where do you start? Really, I think you've got to look at your diet as a whole and look at what you're eating. And if you're eating healthy, a healthy, balanced diet, which is often mainly new natural foods, then you're heading in the right direction. Um, the, the guidelines are that you eat at least five portions of fruit or veg a day. Now, that can sound like a lot to people and often a lot of the population don't meet that target. But actually, a portion is only 80 grams or about what you can fit into the palm of your hand. So it's not a huge amount. It's one apple or one banana or six florets of broccoli. It's not huge, huge amounts. Um, we would say to limit your intake of saturated fat. So that's red meat, that's um, cheese, dairy products. Um, for a South Asian community, that would include ghee. So we would advise people to use less ghee in their cooking. Don't add it to foods. Try to have your chapatis dry um, just to reduce the level of saturated fat in your diet, which will increase your cholesterol and increase your risk of heart disease. Now, what's your view on what are often called fad diets? Yeah. And there's like a new one coming out every week. Absolutely. Do they ever work? And if they're not particularly effective, what other alternatives do we have? My opinion, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm allowed to say it on TV. Um, they don't work. And the reason is, is that most fad diets are very prescriptive. And so over a long time period, they're just not sustainable. Um, people can't cut out huge food groups from their diets for long periods of time. And also, we don't advise that they do. So we don't advise people to cut out wheat, for example, because actually wheat and other carbohydrates, such as bread, potatoes, rice, provide a very nutritional base for a diet. Um, similarly, we don't advise people to cut out dairy products, which a lot of fad diets will advocate. And that's because dairy foods are a vital source of calcium in our diets. And so if we cut that out and we don't replace it with other calcium sources, that leads to problems later on in life, especially in women with conditions such as osteoporosis. Now, obviously, and again, you know, everyone has an, an opinion yeah. about it. And it's interesting that that's your particular view on that. And you might also have a particular view on stress because we hear about stress mm. being the, I think I've heard it, someone mention it being the silent killer almost. Stress is a really important one, Alistair, because um, it, it's a myth. You, you were talking about myths earlier, but um, that there is no evidence to suggest that stress is a risk factor for um, heart disease or stroke. What we do know, though, is sometimes it's how people cope with stress. So actually, some people in a stressful situation may cope very well, and we see people flourish in, in stressful situations. Some people like stress, um, but some people don't cope well under those stress, stressful situations. And what we see then is when people take on unhealthy behaviours mm -hmm. as a result of that stress. And we come back to all those risk factors we've been talking about. It's the unhealthy diet. It's the not taking the exercise. Now, if stress causes those things to happen, well, then that could be in itself the factor that is increasing somebody's risk. But stress in itself isn't a risk factor. Let's now come to people's everyday lifestyles, things they can be doing, some practical advice, and again, stepping away from the fad, but actually just introducing slowly but surely good habits. What other kind of habits should be people be looking at, you know, is sleep a factor? Uh, we talked about diet, we've talked about exercise. Is there anything else? So um, I, that's why the heart age tool is fantastic. Look, so you go on, put your results in, 
and then it will give you the cues that are most relevant to you. Because what we have to remember is sometimes it's a bit daunting to people that, yeah. you know, we've, we've talked about six or seven different things here and people might be sat thinking, oh, crikey, this is just feels almost unachievable mm. to do these things. And what people have got to do is choose the thing that they want to do. So the idea with the heart age tools, it will give you a menu of the things that you could look at and then choose one or two of them. Don't take them all on. The evidence suggests if you try and do everything all in one go, you're not going to do it. Mm. You take one or two of those factors and it might be for somebody, it might be smoking, it might be trying to get a bit more physically active, it might be looking at their diet. But what the tool will do is then take you to the information that will support you, whether it be about diet, whether it be about exercise, whether it be about stopping smoking. And there's lots of resources, lots of tools um, that the tool will link you to to support you in getting where you need to. And at what point should someone say, actually, I'm looking at this result, I need to go and get some medical help? Yeah. What is that normal indicator? So again, that's a really good thing about the tool is it will prompt if you need medical intervention. And for the vast majority, Alistair, that, that, they won't need to go and see a doctor or nurse. So people shouldn't be afraid of taking the test because it's going to reveal something that means you need to go and get some help. The vast majority of people, it's about those lifestyle factors. But for some, it might reveal that, for example, their blood pressure's at a level that you need to do something about it, or their, um, their cholesterol's at a level that needs something um, to be done. And the other thing, actually, is we also know if your risk is so high, then again, you might need to see a, a, a medical expert to help you with that. Um, because for some people, we do need to think about what we call pharmacological drug intervention. Um, and that's predominantly things like blood pressure lowering yeah. treatment, um, cholesterol treatment, for example. So if you're really high risk, then the evidence suggests taking a statin, a cholesterol lowering um, drug, will lower your risk and give you some protection against having a heart attack or stroke. I think people get scared by the thought of medication, but actually high blood pressure, high cholesterol, these are things that are really easily treated. And so by reducing your levels to safe levels, you're really cutting your risk of heart attacks, heart disease and stroke. And so actually it's a really positive step that you can take. And particularly if we think about some of the drug treatments and statins, they're some of the safest mm. drugs that we use, particularly statins, although they get bad press at times, they're one of the safest drugs that we have in our in our kit of prescribing. So um, I would, I'd encourage people yeah. not to be scared about, about these. And the most important thing is it's reducing your risk of having that yeah. heart attack or stroke. Absolutely. What about age? Is there an age when suddenly you become that much more vulnerable? Um, and it is the age at which people do start showing symptoms, is that changing? Are there any particular concerns in younger people today, for example? Well, we're certainly at Blood Pressure UK seeing more people get high blood pressure at a younger age. And I think that's a result of unhealthy lifestyles, be that diet, exercise, or being slightly overweight. Um, but we're definitely seeing high blood pressure in people in their 30s and 40s, whereas traditionally we would have considered it as an older person's disease. And, and, and age in itself is probably the biggest risk factor. So um, the older you get, the, the, you do get an increased risk. Um, but particularly for South Asian um, people, we know that that risk um, starts at a lower age. So particularly, so we were talking about type 2 diabetes earlier, um, where we tend to see that risk of type 2 diabetes being around 40 in the um, white population, it can be as low as, as 20 um, in the South Asian population. So it's even more important that the South Asian population get their um, risk checked. And, you know, you were talking about diet earlier on and, and how that's, you know, a, a key to all of this. And, you know, Public Health England have been talking for years about getting healthy, making sure we eat right and things. Is this message getting through? Because it seems that you're having to just continually remind us all the time. So I think the message is getting through and a lot of the patients that I've spoken to, the patients I've looked after, um, people do want to make a difference. I think sometimes it's hard, though, you know, in the life that we live, we're very busy. Um, we often, a lot of us don't have a lot of time now that we're rushing from work to looking after family, to looking after parents or, or others. And so um, it's about actually... Um, taking, t standing back and thinking about what is the impact, what, what is the longer term impact of these things that we're doing going to have on my health? And again, I come back to the heart age tool. The whole idea is, because this is silent, we don't see it happening. It allows us to step back and think, right, I might be 30, 40, 
what things should I start doing now that are going to give me those extra years, those extra life years of not having a heart attack or stroke? And, and actually most people, Alistair, are really receptive in wanting to do that mm -hmm. and actually prevent it happening in the first place. And of course it's about quality of life when you're older as well. Yeah. But coming back to the educational side of things, there's so many different programmes that, that you have that, you know, you talked about the online monitoring there as well. What about teaching children from a young age? Because sometimes they're not getting that guidance at home. Are there programmes in schools and things that help? There are. Um, it depends, obviously, where the school is now and with the help, with the cuts to funding. Um, however, school dinners are a great way of doing that, um, introducing what is a healthy, balanced diet to children that may not be getting that at home, um, and educating children about what their plate should look like, how, what, how many fruit and vegetables should it have, how much carbohydrate, the proportions of food they're eating as well. And, and what about the parents, you know, getting this whole thing of, of parents and children working together, mm. you know, coming back to, you know, learning how to cook. But there's, there's so many people who don't even seem to know how to cook yeah. from scratch. Unless it comes out of a packet or a box, yeah. they're not familiar with what to do. Well, I think there was almost a lost generation where cooking skills were taken out of schools. But actually, in my experience, that's coming back in and children are being taught about what's healthy, what isn't. Um, my son comes home and will tell me what he's learned at school that day, what they've covered about nutrition. And so I do feel that that is coming back into schools, but I think we can always do more. And what about things that government should be doing? You know, we've got the sugar tax mm. that's been talked about. What other things do you think that could be done at a government level to increase our awareness and increase the, the success, if you like, of a better, healthier programme for us to follow? Well, there's been great success, I think, in the salt reduction programme, which was led by the government. And that was where manufacturers remove salt by stealth almost gradually from their foods so that as a population we didn't tell we couldn't tell the difference and we got used to having less salt in our foods and actually when i now travel abroad if i eat in i go to certain countries and i find the salt too, or the food too salty because we're used to having less salt in the UK. And I think the government is now looking at doing that with sugar as well, which will obviously have a huge beneficial effect because an individual can change their own habits, but as a government and looking at industry, they can make a huge, they can have a huge impact on more people. As a matter of interest, how are we doing in the UK compared with our friends in Europe and other parts of the world when it comes to health education and the levels of heart disease? So in terms of heart disease, you could say that we fare in the middle of the pack, uh, particularly across across Europe. Um, so there's definitely more we could be doing. Um, and if you look at the reductions in, in deaths, um, it has reduced, although it's now starting to plateau. And some experts are starting to suggest it may be starting to go back up. So I don't think we should ever think we've t totally done everything we could do here. There's more to be done. Um, but going back to your point around, I think there's a huge amount of activity already going on in reformularization. People might not necessarily know it, but taking things like sugar um, out of out of the diet. And I know government is working, Public Health England is working with industry to try and actually take some of those sugars out um, of food so it's not there in the first place. And um, Shafali, you were saying earlier, actually, unfortunately, we are in a situation where a lot of people are eating processed and re ready, ready meals already. Um, and so it's even more important that we, that we try and reduce the sugar, the salt um, that's in there. But then the other thing is, um, I, I know my children are constantly on their mobile devices, um, but, but they've got downloaded that app that they can scan. They'll scan the barcodes and actually look what's in there. So I think you're right, Alistair. How do we make sure people do have that education to understand what is in there? And, and they'll be the first to scan something and say, you know, oh, gosh, this has got this in. I'm not having, I'm not going to have that. I'm going to go for a good sugar choice. Yeah. Um, and, but it's got to be made easy for people to make yeah, that And if choice. you make it fun, of yeah. course, people do become naturally more engaged. Yeah. Definitely, but I think, you know, in, in just a few years change, it actually has become that in, in most of, um, or in my own children and, and, and children that my 
children interact with using that vocabulary of a good sugar choice. When, when did you, you know, that, that's there now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Might, they'll, they'll say, you know, is that a good sugar choice? So I think I think we are seeing changes, uh, and but, but there's definitely more we need to be doing. OK, what else should we be doing then? Just before we start wrapping up and giving people towards the end of the show some really good practical reminders of what they can do to stay healthy, what else do you think society could be doing, education could be doing, government could be doing? Um, from an individual point of view, I'd say the biggest step that someone can take for this from this program is to go and get their blood pressure measured and then enter their details into the tool because it's easy to have your blood pressure measured, it's quick and it's free. And actually, it could have a huge, huge impact on your future health. Yeah, no, and I'd agree, definitely. Take, take the test. Work out then what you need to do, but it is really important. It's no good just finding out your numbers, because mm. if you just go and find out what your heart age is and then we go back to what we normally do, your risk is going to be greater. Take the test, then think about, well, what does that actually practically mean for you? For some, as we've described, that might need you to go and talk to your GP or nurse or a pharmacist about the results if you're particularly yeah. concerned with your blood pressure or your cholesterol. Um, but for the vast majority, it might be one of those simple things about getting a bit more um, exercise. Actually, find out what's going on in your local community. There's some great uh, things out yeah. there. Um, I worked in Birmingham for a number of years and um, they were setting up um, walking groups specifically for South Asian communities. Mm -hmm. So where you could find people, similar people like you and then um, two or three times a week you'd join and go and have a, a walk together, for example. Mm -hmm. So there are things out there. Have a look. And, and from the website, um, there's something called um, one you, which is all about you, and it will connect you to all those things that might be able to help you yeah. a bit more. Some people look at all of these things and just hearing you today, you think, oh, my goodness, there's so much I've got to do. Give us just a few golden rules, just a, a few things, because we, we can remember one, two, three, maybe four things. If you had to come up with those golden rules for better cardiovascular health, what would they be? So my, my number one thing is going to be, if you smoke, smoke. stop. Yeah. It is the single biggest cause of, of heart disease and stroke. So if you're a smoker, if you're ready, um, stop. And, and if you're not ready, just start having a look. There, again, there's lots of information out there. Um, there's quitting services. Um, but we've seen huge success with people starting to vape and actually vaping. If, so if you're still smoking tobacco, start vaping um, as, your first, um, as your first step. Um, but yeah, number one would be um, would be stopping smoking. Yeah, I would say reduce your salt content because that will have the biggest effect on your high blood pressure. Um, lose weight if you need to because that will have an effect on your overall health. And, and get a bit more active. active. You use that app that I was saying about the ten minute burst of exercise. So most of us, we should be able to find ten minutes in the day. I know we're all busy, but find that ten minutes. Get out. Remember, though, it's not just a gentle stroll. You need to be getting to a yeah. point that you feel a bit breathless, starting to get sweaty, and you can actually feel your heart pumping. Um, so, yeah, they'll, they'll be yeah. the top things you know, for me. It doesn't even have to involve you going out of your way. Get off the bus or tube a stop earlier and walk that extra bit. I just want to ask you something really quickly. When did you two last use the app? and check out your own, because I can imagine you could become a I bit have, obsessive about it. No, Well, I, I was saying to Jamie, <laughs> I have done it, actually, and I didn't know my cholesterol, but it, the results have motivated me to go and find out my <laughs> cholesterol. Yeah, and, and so, look, you know, in my job, I'm frequently using it and showing people, but the interesting thing, Alistair, is people say they actually like to go back to it as well, mm -hmm. so it's not only about doing it once, so you'll do it, you'll find out some results and maybe come back a few months later and have another go and actually see, has it actually made any difference? Yeah. Did you change anything as a result of go looking it up? Yeah, no, definitely. I think it, it brings it into perspective. Mm -hmm. It makes you realise, as I said, it's, it's a silent thing. It's this thing that... It, you just mm -hmm. aren't aware. Um, one of the things that um, one of the things for me is about you know, I I our environment around us actually sometimes makes it very difficult for us to be healthy. Yeah. The amount of elevators working in London, gosh, the you know the elevators and the lifts that take you up and down. So the, one of the key things I do, Alistair, is I absolute uh, 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 best whenever I can. I use the stairs, and I'm often greeted at the foot of the stairwell only use in case of an emergency. <laughs> no, not for me. I think we've all been there on that <laughs> one. You know, it, it, you've given us some really good tips. You know, get exercising. You know, cut down the smoking if you do smoke, and reduce the salt and eat healthier food. Yeah. 
good tips and of course try the app yeah, as well absolutely it's been, been absolutely brilliant thank you so much and there you have it some really important and helpful advice on cardiovascular health i'd like to thank jamie waterall and also Shafan, shafali there uh, for coming in and telling us more about uh, this amazing thing called our heart and how to look after it if you'd like to know more then please do email us healthshow at islamchannel.tv and once again we must stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or have any concerns it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health topic being discussed. I really hope you enjoyed the show I really hope you're going to get healthier as well but for now it's goodbye and see you soon. Asalaamu Alaikum. <laughs>